Laudatio for the Fields Medalist Gregory Perelman by John Lott, University of Michigan, USA. Thank you. Gregory Perelman was born in 1966. He received his doctorate from St. Petersburg State University. He quickly became renowned for his brilliant work in Riemannian geometry and Alexandrov geometry. Uh, the latter is a form of Riemannian geometry for general metric spaces. Some of Perelman's work in Alexandrov geometry was surveyed in his 1994 ICM talk let me just mention one of his outstanding results in Riemannian geometry. This is the proof of the Sol conjecture. It was conjectured by Cheeger and Gromal in 1972 and finally proved by Perelman in 1994 in a short and striking paper. The statement is that if M is a complete, non-compact Riemannian manifold with non-negative sectional curvatures, and if there is a single point where all of these sectional curvatures are positive, then the manifold is diffeomorphic to Euclidean space. Perlman then shifted the focus of his research to Ricci flow and its applications to the topology of three-dimensional manifolds. Recall the statement of the Poincaré conjecture that a simply connected, compact, three-dimensional manifold is diffeomorphic to the three-sphere. A far-reaching generalization of this conjecture is due to Thurston, the geometrization conjecture. It says that a compact, orientable, three-dimensional manifold can be canonically cut along two-dimensional spheres and tori into so-called geometric pieces. This is a rough version of the conjecture. Of course, there is a more precise version. Perlman's work on these conjectures is along the lines of the Ricci flow approach, the Ricci flow equation was introduced by Richard Hamilton in 1982. Based on his work, a program to prove conjectures, these conjectures using Ricci flow, was initiated by Hamilton and Xing Tang Yao. In 2002 and 2003, Powerman posted three papers on the archive, which together present proofs of the Poincare and geometrization conjectures. His first paper from November 2002 is on the entropy formula. His second paper from March 2003 is on Ricci flow with surgery. And his third paper from July 2003 is about finite extinction time. Detailed expositions of Perlman's work have been given by Sao and Zhu, by Kleiner and myself, and by Morgan and Tian. To say a word about the status of Perlman's papers, it has taken us some time to examine them. This is partly due to the originality of Perlman's work and partly due to the technical sophistication of his arguments. By now, several groups have, of people have gone through Perlman's papers in detail. No serious problems have come to light. Of course, caution is in order when discussing major conjectures, and more people need to check Perlman's work before there can be any universally accepted verdict. However, all indications are that Perelman's arguments are correct. Let me now give a bit of background on the Ricci flow. A fuller description will be in Professor Hamilton's talk. The Ricci flow equation is that the time derivative of the metric is minus twice the Ricci curvature. Here, G of T is a one-parameter family of Riemannian metrics on a manifold M, RIC denotes the Ricci tensor of G of T, which can be constructed from the Riemann curvature tensor. And in most of the talk, I will assume that the manifold M is three-dimensional, compact, and orientable. In his first paper on this subject, Hamilton proved the following landmark result, that if a simply connected, compact, three-dimensional manifold has a Riemannian metric with positive Ricci curvature, then it is diffeomorphic to the three-sphere. You see that this is a version of the Poincaré conjecture, except with the additional assumption 
that there's a metric with positive Ricci curvature. To give some idea of the proof, let's take our manifold with positive Ricci curvature and run the Ricci flow. Then, after a finite amount of time, it shrinks to a point. However, if we rescale it to have constant volume, then Hamilton showed that as time goes on, the manifold becomes rounder and rounder, so in the limit, we can recognize that it is the three-sphere. Over the years, many important results about Ricci flow were obtained by Hamilton and others. Let me just mention one more landmark result of Hamilton. Suppose that the normalized Ricci flow on our manifold has a smooth solution that exists for all positive time and has uniformly bounded sectional curvatures. Then the manifold satisfies the geometrization conjecture. This clearly showed that Ricci flow is a promising approach to proving the geometrization conjecture. There were two remaining issues, how to deal with possible singularities in the flow and how to remove the assumption about the sectional curvatures. About singularities, one example is the so-called neck pinch. Suppose that we start with our manifold in the following configuration and run the Ricci flow. Then it can go singular in a finite amount of time, and the reason is that there is a two-sphere which is pinching down to a point. To deal with this, Hamilton introduced the idea of surgery, actually in the four-dimensional context. Here is our flow, which was going singular. Let's take a region of the part which is forming the singularity. In this case, that would be an interval across a two-sphere. Let's cut that out and then cap it off by two three balls to obtain a new manifold. We can then continue the Ricci flow. Now, when we do the surgery, of course, we change the topology of the manifold. However, it changes in a controllable way. The neck pinch was one example of a singularity, and one can ask, what are the possible singularities? Well, it's known that singularities come from a sectional curvature blow-up. Hamilton introduced a rescaling method to analyze the possible singularities. To illustrate this, here's our manifold, which was going singular. Let's take a sequence of space-time points where the sectional curvatures are blowing up. Then let's rescale it so that after the rescaling, the sectional curvatures are basically unit in value. Then in this case, you see that we can form a limit namely a cylinder R cross S2. So to summarize, the idea of blow-up analysis is to take a convergent subsequence of these rescale solutions to try to get a limiting Ricci flow solution. This will model the formation of the singularity. A basic question is whether such a limit exists. If it does, it'll be very special. First, it will live for all negative time, what's called an ancient solution. And secondly, it has non-negative curvature from a result of Hamilton and Ivy. Now, Hamilton's compactness theorem gives sufficient conditions to extract such a convergent subsequence. In these rescale solutions, one needs two things. First, one needs uniform curvature bounds on balls. And secondly, one needs a uniform lower bound on the injectivity radius at the base point. One can get the needed curvature bounds by carefully choosing these blow-up points. There were two remaining obstacles. First, how to get the needed injectivity radius bound. And second, what are the possible blow-up limits? These problems were solved by Perelman. Let me discuss three themes of Perelman's work the no local collapsing theorem, Ricci flow with surgery, and the long time behavior. Perelman's first breakthrough in Ricci flow was the no local collapsing theorem from his first paper. The precise statement is written at the bottom, but let me just try to summarize the content of it. Suppose we have a Ricci flow that exists for a finite time interval then if we have a ball which has the sectional curvature bounds, that implies that we have the needed ejectivity radius bound at the center of that ball. 
The implication is that one can take these blow-up limits. To say a word about Perelman's method of proof, he introduces new monotonic quantities for Ricci flow, which he calls W entropy and the reduced volume. These quantities arise from a deep new understanding of the underlying structure of the Ricci flow equation. To illustrate the idea of the proof, let's look at the W functional as a function of time. It's non-decreasing. However, Perelman shows that if his theorem were not true, that is, if one had local collapsing, then that would force the W functional to go to minus infinity, which contradicts the monotonicity. Perelman then gives the following classification of the possible blow-up limits. There are some compact possibilities. It could be a finite quotient of the round shrinking three-sphere, or it could be diffeomorphic to the three-sphere or real projective space. For the non-compact possibilities, it could be a round shrinking cylinder or its Z2 quotient, or it could be diffeomorphic to R3, and after rescaling, each time slice looks neck-like at infinity. Perlman then proves the canonical neighborhood theorem, which says that any region of high scalar curvature is modeled up to rescaling by one of these blow-up limits. Let me now pass to Ricci flow with surgery. There are two main issues here. First, to find the two spheres along which one wants to cut, and secondly, to show that the surgery times do not accumulate. If the surgery times accumulated, one might never get to a time where one could recognize the topology of the manifold. Here's a picture of what the manifold might look like at the first singularity time. There's a region called omega sub rho where the scalar curvature is not too big. Coming off of this, there's a finite number of so-called epsilon horns, and then there could be other connected components, such as in this picture, so-called double epsilon horns. Here is Perelman's surgery procedure. You take each of these epsilon horns, you take a point within it, and you rescale to get something which looks cylindrical. Then you slice this along a transverse two-sphere and glue in a three-ball. Now, one can do this at the first singularity time, but here is the main problem. At the later singularity times, we still have to find those two spheres along which we're going to cut. In order to do this, we still need to know the validity of this canonical neighborhood theorem and the no local collapsing theorem. The problem is that the earlier surgeries could invalidate the proofs of these theorems. Let me just describe one ingredient of Perelman's solution to this problem. It is to perform the surgery deep within these epsilon necks. Perelman shows that if one does this, one ends up doing surgery, in effect, on very long, thin tubes, as is illustrated here. So to summarize, Perelman proves the following technically difficult surgery theorem. One can choose the surgery parameters so that there is a well-defined Ricci flow with surgery that exists for all time. And in particular, there's only a finite number of surgeries on any finite time interval. Now, there could be an infinite number of total surgeries. One of Perelman's insights is that one can extract topological consequences nevertheless. So finally, let me say something about the long time behavior of the Ricci flow. The first case is when the starting manifold is simply connected. In this case, the finite extinction time theorem says that after a finite time, there's nothing left. The remaining manifold is just the empty set. As a consequence, the manifold is a connected sum of the various pieces which disappeared. In other words, it's a connected sum of standard pieces, namely quotients of the round three sphere, or S1 cross S2 factors. But since we're assuming the original manifold is simply connected, it follows that it's diffeomorphic to a three sphere, which is the Poincaré conjecture. 
Now, in the general case, the starting manifold may not be simply connected. In order to see the long-time behavior of the Ricci flow, let's divide the time t metric by the factor t. And let me say that x is a connected component of the time t manifold. Here's the desired picture for x. We would like to say that it has incompressible two tori, so that if we cut along those two tori, the remaining pieces are either hyperbolic or graph type. Here, hyperbolic means that it admits a finite volume, uh, me, finite volume metric of constant negative sectional curvature. On the other hand, graph manifolds are a very special type of three manifolds. In order to achieve this, Perelman introduces a thick, thin decomposition. I won't give the precise definition, but the thick part of X has the properties that it is locally volume non-collapsed and has local two-sided sectional curvature bounds. On the other hand, the thin part of X is locally volume collapsed and has a local lower sectional curvature bound. Then the statement about the thick part is that it becomes hyperbolic. That is, for a large time, the thick part of X approaches the thick part of a finite volume manifold of constant sectional curvature minus one quart. And in addition, the cuspidal tori, if there are any, are incompressible in X. The proof of this is based partly on arguments from Hamilton's non-singular flow paper. For the thin part, the statement is that for a large time, it is a graph manifold. Putting this together, the upshot is that the original manifold M is a connected sum of pieces X, each having a hyperbolic graph decomposition. This implies the geometrization conjecture. So in conclusion, Gregory Powerman has revolutionized the fields of geometry and topology. His work on Ricci flow is a spectacular achievement in geometric analysis. Powerman's papers show profound originality and enormous technical skill. We will certainly be exploring Powerman's ideas for many years to come. Thank you.